showers we plead. Great singing. Please be seated. All right, let's go ahead and take our Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of Galatians chapter number 5 if we could. Galatians chapter number 5. Dr. C. Oscar Johnson had been a preacher for many years in the city of St. Louis. He illustrated a great biblical truth uh, for this story from his childhood. He said, my father was a blacksmith and I spent much time pumping uh, the bellow that made the fire hot. He never bought uh, ready-made horseshoes. He always made them. He would put a strip of iron in the fire and leave it until it was white hot, then holding it with a pair of tongs, bent it around the anvil by tapping lightly with a hammer. When it was the right size and shape for the horse he was shoeing, he would heat it again and turn the ends down to make the cleats. It seemed so easy that one day, when, he, when we were not busy, I asked him uh, to let me make, make a shoe. A smile of amusement broke over his face as he answered, All right. I'll pump the bellows, and you make the shoe. When the strip of iron was hot, I took it off the forge and tried to bend it around the circular end of the anvil. The more I hammered, the funnier it looked. It was twisted and lopsided. My father took the tongs and held up the shoe. He simply shook his head and said, Son, I never saw the horse that could wear that shoe, and tossed it back into the fire. After a moment, he said to me, Let's... Let's instead make one together. You know, I have made a thousand mistakes when I did something by myself, but never a single one when I depended upon the Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit's power. Tonight we're going to be launching into a new series I've simply entitled Spirit-Filled Living. Next to salvation, learning to be filled by the Spirit of God are really controlled by the Holy Spirit is the most essential part of the Christian life. The most frustrating way to live the Christian life is the opposite, being filled or controlled by the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, we'll start tonight in verse 16 and verse 17 to kick this series off. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Let's begin our series as I want to address this thought, the frustration of fleshly living. The frustration of fleshly living. Let's pray. Father in heaven tonight, I thank you. For the truth that we will look at tonight, I do pray that it would help each and every one of us learn what it means more to be filled with the Spirit and to desire it. Lord God, it's the most, it's the most powerful way to live. We want to walk in your ways and walk in your Spirit. But Lord, let, help us not to be confused by it, but understand, Lord God, living in the flesh is not helpful either. I do pray your time your, your blessing on this time tonight may you get glory in jesus name amen you know the christian life at least the way the bible outlines it is meant to be the most fulfilling abundant way one could ever live that's why it's supposed to be it's supposed to be the most supreme philosophy of life if you want to want to put it that way i think jesus said that pretty clearly in John 10, 10. The thief coming not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. I'm come that they might have life. That's just not the physical, breathing, heart-pumping life. It's just life itself. Filled with all the, the good things that there is, and that they might have it more abundantly. That's God's desire for every born-again Christian, is to have an abundant life. Now, unfortunately, because of misnomers that are presented and preached in Christianity today and our, our American mentality, we think the abundant life is four-car garage, a hot rod. You know, it used to be six-digit, now probably seven-digit type income where life is comfortable and there's no problems. Now, we might have, get some of those types of things in life, but that doesn't mean your life is abundant. 
It doesn't mean that you have daily joy, daily peace, daily contentment. It doesn't mean anything like that at all. Because there are people that have those things and lack all those things that I mentioned. The abundant life speaks of being at peace, having joy in the soul, being able to, to love regardless of what's going on in life. That's the kind of life the Lord wants to give us. Yet, for many of God's precious people, they, they just don't seem to, seem to have that. It's just not the case for them. They live, they live very frustrated lives. Real broken lives. Almost every day they're crabby. Almost every day they're irritable. They can't be around other people because, you know what, everyone makes them mad. You know, that's sad. Because it's not meant to be that way. I understand some people are more extroverted than others. Some are more introverted than others. But the reason people are that way is because there's a problem in the heart. A big time problem that needs to be dealt with. And they're not filled with the Spirit. See what is happening here is you see the thief is stealing from them. Stealing their joy, stealing their peace, stealing any love that they might have in their heart. It's killing it, destroying everything in their lives. Robbing them of the very things that God has promised, as he says here, to give. That abundant life. Every day of their lives. Again, that means that there is something wrong or something not understood by that person. And maybe tonight you're one of those people. Where every day is a kind of a battle and a struggle. <laughs> Everybody has bad days. Don't misunderstand that. But for some people, it's almost like every day is a bad day. And, and for a born-again Christian, that ought not to be. You have to remember our greatest problem was solved the day we got saved. You were on the road to hell as I was on the road to hell, and Jesus saved your soul and pulled you off and put you on the road to heaven. Amen. If nothing else goes right in your life, hey, <laughs> that's pretty good. Because one day this world will be gone, and the one to come is going to be here, and that will be forever. That's the greatest problem you ever had. But, but, you know, I, I don't think God wants us to be miserable while we're here either. I think he wants us to be a testimony by our attitude and our spirit that what we have, others should desire. That what we have is real and not just talk and religion. Right? It's sad because that person is living below their spiritual means. And that's a very sad state to live as a Christian. Constantly defeated. Emotionally. Constantly defeated in everything in life. In attitudes and in thoughts. It doesn't have to be that way. See, the Christian life is meant to be the supreme way of life. But yet... It, for some, it doesn't look like it. And if those people were honest, they'd say, it hasn't been what I thought it would be like. So what's the problem? Well, the goal of this series is to help us get to the root of that problem. And our text is really the goal, <laughs> if, you, if you look at it. It's very plain. Walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's the, that's the objective. A person who's walking in the Spirit is filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. And you know something? All that fleshly living will be lessened in the life. Our desire is to learn what it means to be Spirit-filled people. Because too often we may be flesh-controlled and not even realize it. Not even realize it. You know, you can come to church and do cross all your T's and dot all your I's and still be flesh controlled. Be completely flesh controlled. Well, I've got all the standards right, Pastor. Yeah, but your pride smells like 
You fill in the blank. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, it's just like, yeah, you can be flesh controlled and have all the standards right. And you can be flesh controlled and, and, and run after sin the same way. Right. It happens both ways. How do I know I'm flesh controlled? You probably know because you feel how you feel on the inside. You're not joyful. You're miserable. Grieved. Constantly in a state of insecurity. Constantly not experiencing the fruit of the Spirit. We want to try to fix that, though. That's the goal. We want to try to fix that. Correct some, some misnomers. Correct some things that might be in there. Because we want to know how this applies to us. We want to know what it means to become spirit-filled because we want every Christian to experience the abundant life. That's, what is, that's, that's the whole goal here. These are issues amongst so many others that I hope to address through this series because if we don't learn how to be spirit-controlled, we'll naturally default to the flesh. And we'll make fleshly choices that result in, well, fleshly negative consequences. We slow to the flesh, we will what? Reap corruption, Galatians 6. We'll never have peace of mind. We will be void of joy and just simply frustrated with our Christian existence. Now, if you're saved here tonight, it's going to be very hard for you to live in the flesh, thankfully. If you're truly saved, it, it, it's going to be hard because you're quenching your greatest friend, the Holy Spirit of God. Quenching him. Grieving him. The most miserable person on planet Earth isn't necessarily a lost person. It's a saved person who's walking in the flesh. <laughs> because they're going with what they feel, sinfulness, but sin always reaps negative consequences, and guilt and shame, and they're grieving the very one that's trying to prevent them from doing that, and that makes them miserable too, so they're double miserable. What a terrible place to be, right? The worst and the most miserable place to be is what we call a backslidden, flesh-controlled Christian person. We don't want to be that way. We don't. But it's going to take some understanding, and it's going to take us applying some of the things we'll cover in this series. We don't want to live carnally, worldly, giving over to our fleshly appetites all the time. Because God's called us to live on a higher plane where the abundant life is so that our Christianity you know, has some sellability. You know what I mean by that? You know, you were trying to sell a product What's the greatest way you can sell a product? By being able to testify how it helped you right. and help others. <laughs> if you can't testify with a clear conscience that your Christianity has changed you and made you in a more joyful, loving, caring person, how are you going to ever convince anybody else to come to Jesus Christ? Never will. See, it's got to be real to you first before it can be real to anybody else. There's just, a, there's just no power behind it. Now, you can lie your way about it, but God won't honor it. It's got to be real. And that's what we want. No lost person will ever take it seriously if we who claim to be Christians live like the flesh controls our every choice. Because guess what? Why would they want something they already have? Fleshly living themselves. So let's consider today why it's so frustrating for us to live fleshly lives. As we see, first off, what I call the pre-salvation existence. Now, before salvation, our lives are totally dictated by our flesh. Now, to define just briefly what the flesh is, that is simply the sinful nature that we have all inherited as a result of the fall back in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve took of that forbidden fruit, they sinned against God, and everyone who descends from them, which is every one of us, 
have inherited that sin nature. The Bible is very clear on that, and I think everyone here understands that. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Of course, we sin by nature, and we sin by choice. Sin is all we were about, whether we realize it or not. As lost people, we gave ourselves over to whatever we felt like. If you go to the book of Ephesians, just a couple pages ahead here, chapter 2, I think familiar verses for many here. It says, Paul's writing to the Ephesians, of course he's recounting their lost life. And you hath he quickened, brought back to life, saved, who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were spiritually dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. In other words, our lifestyle choices were in line with what the world was telling us. Everything it was telling us to say, this is what's important in life, this is, this is what's cool, this is what's in vogue, this is what it's like right now. And if you ever notice anything about society, its values and its morality changes with the wind. Some of us have been, old, have been around long enough to watch, the, uh, watch the, the morality go from here to there to everywhere. It changes depending on what's become popular and what's become in vogue and what's become that way. And you, you look at history, it has constantly done that. In fact, I think it goes faster now because of the, the increased ability to communicate. It's, it just changes with the wind, with whatever, wherever the wind blows. And that's the way we walk, with whatever the world was saying. And who is in charge of that world? Well, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Well, that is Satan. The Bible calls him the god of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.3. He's the one that's setting the tempo. He's the one that's advising and influencing all the different things going on in the world. Can I just say this? Be mindful of things that are championed by the world because usually there's something satanic behind it. Always. It just always is. Because the world doesn't celebrate godliness, the world celebrates wickedness. And will emphasize those who will help promote it. And there are many people who are celebrated today, but you look at what they support and look at what they're about, and it's all what the world is saying, this is the way we should go. Every last one of them. Notice what happens with people who go against the grain of the world. They're attacked, maligned, and discounted. Even if they had a position of prominence at one point, they'll be sought to be chopped down. Because Satan does not want anybody causing the world to turn from him. That's the, that's the way the world is. It's the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who's that? The unsaved. The unsaved. And that's where we were. We were those people who walked according to the course of this world, not even realizing whose drumbeat we were following. And it was a spirit that worked in us. Now, that granted, some people have given themselves more over than others. But it's still the same spirit we were following. Among also, whom, verse 3, whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh. In other words, we, our lifestyle was in line with what the lusts of our flesh desired. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So we lived life spiritually dead, which means we were disconnected from God. Even if we were religious, we understand that. There, there is no connection there. Because we had no personal relationship with God. Uh, the, our sin was a wall between him and us. And we made our choices in line with the world that is influenced and controlled by Satan and lived according to our lusts, which were sinful, inordinate affections. Again, some may have gotten into worse sin than others, but everyone who has lost lives their life according to the flesh. That's, that's exactly what he's saying here. And, and he said, that's the way it was for you, as it was for me. And it goes on, but 
God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Of course, it talks about the salvation experience. We'll get to that more here in a moment. Things change then. But the truth of the matter is this. Lost people live according to their flesh and their sin nature. And that's why you see the decisions that are made that they are. And sometimes as born-again Christians, and I included in this, <laughs> you get a little frustrated with that sometimes, don't you? Like, what are they thinking? And i got to remember, as you have to remember, what they're following and what we had been following. And we have to be, be uh, you know, a little bit gracious, too, remembering that, you know what, they need to be prayed for and witnessed to. In Ephesians 4, verse 17, if you flip ahead just a, a page or two, it says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance of, that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, which is just lustful living, to work all uncleanness with greediness. So again, this, this verse, these verses communicate to us the lifestyle of the lost. Something that we all at one point in our life participated in. Sin was our master. It controlled our many decisions of our lives that brought rotten fruit within us and without us and waiting for us in eternity. Our sin, whether we realize, realize it or not, was destroying us. But that's the way we live. Paul wrote in Titus 3.3, 3, For we ourselves were also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's a description of a lost person living in the flesh, which they can only do. Okay? But we see, secondly, what I call the pivotal salvation experience. Thankfully, God brought the gospel message across our life's path. If you've been saved here tonight, God brought that message across your path one way or another and, and share, had it shared with you and maybe shared multiple times and somebody sat down with you or you heard preaching or you read a track or whatever it might be, but God brought the message across your path and you recognize that sin was destroying you. And would condemn you for all eternity if you didn't get God's help to deal with it. So we came to understand that Christ's death on the cross took place because our sins put him there. We learned that Christ's death provided the only atonement of sin available, and that was his shed blood. We discovered that we must be born again in order for that blood to cover our sins and make us right with God. And we came to understand that we agreed to God's terms of salvation. We were willing to repent of our sin and place faith alone in Jesus Christ. And someday, someday in the past, we called upon him. We sought his forgiveness. And he cleansed us from our sin and put us on the road to heaven. That was a great day. If you can recount that day. But so much more happened that day than we realize. One of the best things that happened that day was God placed his Holy Spirit into you. That was, a, that was a good thing that happened. Now, we didn't feel it. He didn't start in one finger and start doing this and go out the other. Or come from the top of your head down to your toes and your toes tingle and you start getting jiggy with it or whatever they say. They didn't do anything like that. You didn't feel a thing. The wind didn't rush through the room. There was no abnormal emotional experience. We know it because God tells us in his word that it happened. Amen. That's how we know it. That's the only way we, we know it, at least initially. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The Holy Spirit of God, he came within us. He came to, to live within us. That's a unique thing. Because there are no pagan gods out there that come to live within the body and dwell within a person than God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. The true God. All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? 
God lives inside of you and inside of me. That's a special privilege tonight. God is inside of you and in me. Boy, that puts a whole new twist on things, doesn't it? I mean, our stinky old fleshly body, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within. And he's glad to, to live within. The Holy Spirit is God's down payment of our redemption that will fully be realized more at death. But it's so much more than that. At salvation, God didn't take us out of the world. He left us here to live and to witness for him, to testify to others of what redemption can do for them. But in the flesh, that is impossible. Because the Bible says in Romans 7, 18, For I know that is in me, this is Paul testifying, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. (laughs) Paul openly admits the struggle it is to live out God's commands to fulfill his will in his own fleshly strength. Jesus told the disciples, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And they learned that too that night. Remember old Peter, he thought he was, he'd go to Jesus to death. He went whimpering away after a little maid called him out there outside Caiaphas' house. Weeping and bitterly because he denied his Lord not once, not twice, but three times. Now before we get on old Peter though, I wonder how many times we have denied him. We have denied him ourselves. But that's the flesh. It is weak. It is weak. The flesh itself is totally contrary to God and loathes to obey God. It doesn't want to obey God. And that is the very nature we possess naturally. So God gave us a helper, a companion, a comforter, in the Holy Spirit of God. And what he does is help level the playing field, as it were, so that we can live the Christian life the way God wants it, the way the Bible lays it out, in holiness and righteousness, with joyfulness, not grievousness. That's why this salvation experience is pivotal in a person's life. This is why an unsaved person cannot live the Christian life. They can go about it so much, they can try to try to perform what everyone else performs, but it's not going to be real. And eventually it comes out that they are not really possessors. Because you need the Spirit of God, just like I need the Spirit of God, to obey this book and to fulfill God's will and it not be grievous and cumbersome and difficult, but desirous. That is something totally contrary to to the lost person. Before I was saved, I remember I was in, when I, I started reading my Bible more when I was in boot camp. And I came back from that and went to college, and I, I had a Bible, and I, man, I thought, oh boy, I'm going to read one chapter a day. Let me tell you something, that was tough. It was tough. I didn't naturally desire that at all. But I did it because, well, it's a good thing to do. When I got saved, my wanter towards spiritual things changed. And if you're truly saved here today, you can testify the same thing. My desire for spiritual stuff is a lot more inclined. I have a, I have a desire to go to church. I have a desire to live for the Lord. I have a desire that's not naturally there. I would have never been a pastor, I'll guarantee you that right now. Never in my wildest dreams would that ever be. 
I remember years ago, my denomination I was in, I was like in confirmation class and we had to meet with the minister and he was trying to recruit people for the ministry. And let's just put it this way, I just said, kindly declined. <laughs> no, there was no desire of mine whatsoever. It, it's different when you get truly saved because there's, some, there's something that's changed within. And that change is wrought about because God's living inside of you. He's real in there. And it'll bother you. I honestly, I believe real God-fearing, born-again Christians will be bothered by sin and not swim in it. And that's what alarms me with, with the modern movements of Christian liberty, we're going to go live any way we want. They have no grievousness over sin. And that, that, that is really problematic. I couldn't do the things that I used to do. I, do, I sin more than I want to. Because my wanter changed when God's Spirit came within. In fact, it's a pivotal change in life. Not just regarding the eternal state of a person, but it'll literally transform somebody from the inside out. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Is that you? Can you testify... Since that day, whenever it was for you, I've been different. I haven't always been perfect, <laughs> but I'm different. Some people make professions and they've never been different. They've never been different. Say, so what happened to them? They never got it. You can pray a prayer, you can pay a thousand prayers, but if you didn't mean business and didn't repent of sin and didn't didn't want to go in a new direction in life, you didn't get it. Right. It's not because there, there needs to be a change of heart that goes in with a change of direction. There's a difference when the Spirit of God comes in. But it doesn't just happen to without some cooperation on our part, as we see thirdly and finally tonight, the post-salvation experience. Now let's go back to our passage in Galatians chapter number 5. But this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, that these are contrary the one to the, the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now notice, this is a command. This is in the command form. Walk in the Spirit. That's, that's a command. That's, if we're commanded to do something, that means we are responsible to do it. Okay? We need to be consciously making the choice to walk in the Spirit. And when we make that choice, it will temper and defeat the lusts of the flesh. It will help put it down. Now the post-salvation experience is one where we now have two competing natures. Remember, as the lost person, there really was no check on the lusts, other than Maybe peer pressure from the different societies that you might live in. But after salvation, that spirit comes within the person. All of a sudden you've got the old nature and then the new nature. The Holy Spirit and the old flesh. And they butt heads. They do. That's what it's communicating here. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. They are going at it. What are they trying to do? Have control of you. Because you and I are going to serve something. God wants us to serve him. The flesh still wants us to serve ourselves. And whatever it wants, and craves, and desires, and what makes it feel good. That's, what it'll, that, that's, that's the battle that goes on in every Christian's life. That old Adamic sinful nature and the Holy Spirit vying for control. Those that learn how to walk in the Spirit, according to this passage, will be able to defeat the flesh. Those who walk after the flesh 
will be constantly defeated by sin. And living a very frustrated Christian existence filled with guilt, regret, and defeat. Go over to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Romans 6. I think some of you may have read this when Brother Beckham was here as he was talking about reading these chapters. Romans 6 declares our victory over sin because it mentions sin shall not have dominion over us anymore. That's a wonderful thought. Chapter 7 talks about the struggle that there is with sin still in the person's life. As Paul openly admits, well, in me dwell no good thing, right? Who is, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this? And then he praises the Lord Jesus Christ. Through him I can. And then verse chapter 8 tells us how. Through the power of the Spirit of God. But you see here in Romans 8, verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, we can walk after the flesh or we can walk after the Spirit. So what does it mean to walk? It simply means the constant daily decisions that you and I make that progress us forward into time. You know, you're con we're constantly moving forward in time and we're either walking with a mindset of the Spirit or we're walking and making decisions according to the flesh. That's all it is. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. In other words, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6 is very telling. For to be carnally minded, which just simply means fleshly minded, is death. Well, however you want to interpret death, whatever death means here, all I can say is it's a bad thing. I mean, you just kind of sum it up that way. That doesn't sound positive to me. You can, you know, figure out exactly what that means, but it just, I think we can figure out enough that this is just bad stuff. Whenever we walk according to the flesh, it's just not going to go well in life. It's not. It's going to be rough. And the Christian life will be a continual struggle for you. And it'll, it'll be void of the abundance that Jesus talked about. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Well, that sounds a lot better to me, doesn't it? That sounds a lot better. To have peace and joy within the soul. Because to be carnally minded is enmity with God, against God. For it's not subject to the law of God, neither can, indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Look at verse 9. But you're not in the flesh. When the Spirit is so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. See, in the flesh, we cannot please God, <laughs> and it won't be very pleasing to ourselves. Now, we might feel good at the moment. Sin always tastes good to begin with, but it leaves a bitter aftertaste. My pastor used to always put it this way, all of Satan's apples have worms in them. You bite into it, oh, it looks great, crunch. Oh, pfft, oh. You spit it out, because it's the after effects of sin are never as good as what we thought they would be. All, all the time. Now we may think that we can get away with it and I'm not going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do things in secret, behind closed doors. Nobody else is seeing. I can smile and be happy at church, but I'm going to be a different person away from church. Can I just say this? You're probably miserable. And you're probably, because you're fake. And God sees it. You know it. The flesh is in control and it's robbing you of every ounce of joy that you're supposed to have. But that's not the way it's meant to be. The reason for so much misery in the Christian life, bottom line, the simple thing is this. It's sin. It's sin on some level. I understand that is very simplistic, but it is the answer if you, if you look at it. It just really comes down to identifying what that specific thing is and repenting and confessing and repenting it and getting it right. Bottom line. That's all it is. It's just something in our life that we don't understand or, we, or we're doing, or a mentality we have that simply needs to be corrected. 
Because sin always robs us of joy, peace, strength, wisdom, love. It will always rob us of that. Instead, he, God wants us to give us the fruit of the Spirit. Go back to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. See, a Spirit-filled person will experience all of these attributes. within their being. Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the election, the affections and lusts. So we see here at the end there that, you know, God says the flesh isn't going to help you. You need to put it to death. Other places it talks about crucifying it and, and mortifying You know, all these things. Because the flesh isn't any help to us. Consider tonight, though, if if any of these things are within our hearts that would be opposing to those fruits. Tonight, instead of love, do you have hate in your heart? Christians hate people? Yeah, yeah. I have. Oh, pastor, you should repent. I have had to several times in my life. There's some people really get my goat. But that's, that's real. Love and hate. Do you have joy in your heart? Or do you have sorrow? Hmm. Why is there sorrow there? Well, it's obviously not one of the fruit of the Spirit. Instead of peace, do you have fear? Instead of long-suffering, are you impatient? Instead of gentleness, are you mean? Are you mean? Some Christians are downright mean. (laughs) Instead of goodness, do you do wrong? Instead of faith, are you filled with unbelief? Instead of meekness, are you filled with pride? Instead of temperance, are you unrestrained in your passions? See, if we we exhibit the opposite of that, it's very easy to see, I'm not filled with the Spirit. (laughs) I mean, it's just kind of like, whoa, yeah. When we possess those attitudes on any level, any one of those, all the other ones will be there. And if we possess the fruit of the Spirit, all of those will be there. Kind of, you don't have one without the other. And that's how you know whether or not you're in this, filled with the Spirit or not. Are those in existence? Now, we can't work up the fruit of the Spirit. All right, I won't hate anymore. I'll love. <laughs> no, <laughs> you can't quite do that. I won't be fearful anymore. I'll, I'll have faith. You can't work up the fruit of the Spirit. You can't. See, that comes when you walk with Him. That means you have to spend time in the presence of God. It's not hard to conjure up the opposite. (laughs) I've noticed in my life and I imagine in yours. And sadly, sometimes that dominates our life far more than the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. It's usually whatever we're feeding more. If we're feeding our flesh so much of the garbly gook, the junk food food of the world, you're going to be walking in the flesh just like that. If that's all we take into our mind, into our eye gate, and into our ear gate, then guess what? You're going to be walking in the flesh more often than not. It's just the way it is. What you feed, you will strengthen. What you starve, you will weaken. Now, if you take in a lot of spiritual stuff, fill your life with his word, with godly music, things that would inspire righteousness, you're going to tend to be more spiritually minded, which is life and peace, right? All those things. It just really comes down to our exposure. 
My prayer tonight is that we would experience the fruit of the Spirit in our lives far more than we do, maybe. That we would get increasing victory in our lives over sin, which will bring about true transformation and empowerment so that we can be fruitful and faithful to Him. It's really the ultimate goal in this series. We want to be fruitful and faithful to Him. But we have to learn what it means to be filled with the Spirit, recognize when we've crossed the Spirit, how to get right in that, and really the necessity of having it so that we can be fruitful and useful for His glory and honor. And to be able to do so even when things aren't going so well in our outer life. He can still be much real and much alive in my inner life. May God help us tonight to recognize that fleshly living is the most frustrated way to live. But the most joyful way to live is to learning how to be filled with him. Be controlled by him in a way that does something that makes him real to others that see us. Let's take a few moments and stand to our feet tonight. The pianist will come. Tonight, I'm not trying to get down on anybody tonight because I am in the same battle that you are in. And I find myself not exhibiting those fruits at times, that fruit. But, I, but the, that will happen to every single person, I believe. Some learn how to overcome that. Some learn what it means and strive to walk in the Spirit and they strive to be filled. And they experience more of that than not. Tonight, if God spoke to your heart in some capacity, can I encourage you to spend some time with him in prayer? Say, Lord, I want to be filled. Would you fill me, control me? I give myself over to you tonight. I surrender myself to you. I don't want any of those, those negative things. And if I've had them, I'm sorry, Lord. We'll probably have to do a lot of that confessing in life. I want the Christian life to be real to me. I want God to be real. I want God to use me. And I trust that's exactly what every person here wants. But you can't do it on your own. Without the power of the Spirit of God filling us, controlling us, enabling us, using us, there really is no hope. Fleshly living is frustrating living. We're miserable. <laughs> People around us see it. And it's kind of a sorry way to live, to be honest with you. Play through one more time tonight. Do business with God. God loves you and wants to use you, wants to strengthen you and enable you and, and magnify himself through you. But we can't do that in the flesh. We cannot do that. That would be the most defeated way to live. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for your word, what it shows us. I pray every person here tonight, we would walk in the Spirit and learn to be fulfilled or filled by Him, controlled by Him, and to find the newfound power and joy in life that will transform us. Father, you're real. May you be real to us through this, through this series, so that we may glorify your name and have the abundant life that you have promised through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. May you have been glorified in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Just a couple quick announcements before we depart. We do have a couple sign-up sheets, one for the Lyft Fellowship and also for uh, the Fall Fellowship. So please sign up where appropriate and uh, be part of those different events. Uh, this Saturday, we have outreach at 1030. Come out and help us get the word of God out to our needy, needy area. 
and get it as we'll be sewing, door knocking, all those types of things, whatever you feel comfortable you can do. We would appreciate all the help that we could get as we have, a, again, a, a very needy area needing to get the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, on Sunday mornings, we have the prayer meeting now at 8.45 for till 9.05. It'll be here in the sanctuary most of the time, unless we've got some musicians that desperately need to practice up here. I guess I'll get that from Neil if, if that's the case. But uh, anyways, come be part of that as we, we ask the Lord's blessing and the Lord's help for our Sundays. And of course, Tuesdays, remember, through the next couple months at least, will be our prayer and fasting days. We'll have, of course, uh, that prayer meeting on se at 7 here those nights as well. Andy, why don't you come and just close with a word of prayer, if you could. Have a good second half of your week. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this night. We thank you for uh, this time of worship in your house. We thank you for the message. We thank you for your goodness and blessings upon our lives and for your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us uh, to live uh, Holy Spirit-filled lives and so help us to not give in to the lust of the flesh. It's so tempting to default to how we used to live before salvation and go after things of this world. But help us to remember that those things won't satisfy us. We can only find true satisfaction and growth um, in you through your Holy Spirit. Help us uh, to spend time in prayer um, and reading your word to increase our faith and may you, through your Holy Spirit, uh, mold us into the image of your